Good. Time goes quickly. <laughs> so today I wanted to talk about happiness, which is uh, perhaps not that often discussed in Buddhism. Um, obviously, we we think about happiness as the end goal of practice. You know, the Buddha says the happiness of nibbana is the highest happiness. But there are many happinesses leading up to that too, and I think. You know, it's a common conception, perhaps for most practitioners, but maybe more so in the West, or perhaps coming from traditions such as Vipassana, that we also have to suffer quite a lot on the path, and that that suffering is somehow part of um, the purification. You know, and, and somehow that the more we suffer, the more we're eradicating our defilements and moving towards enlightenment. And of course, there may be some truth in that, in the sense that we will meet things in, within our minds that are difficult. You know, things that we don't really want to see and that we haven't been particularly honest about before. And sometimes that can be difficult, you know. But uh, in the Buddha's teachings, and in one particular teaching that I like very much, he talks about the path as a basically refinement of wholesome happiness. Right? And how the practice, starting with suffering, because suffering is often the catalyst that, you know, causes us to search for a way out how that suffering can then lead to confidence, and from confidence, a whole sequence begins, which begins from joy. Right? And this is a really beautiful teaching, because he's saying that it's a very natural process. You know, as soon as we have some suffering in life, we tend to look for a way out. And when we develop confidence that there can be that way out, you know, through hearing the teachings of the Buddha, this gives rise to a lot of joy, a sense of relief in my case, you know, when I heard the teachings for the first time. Even before there'd been very much benefit, it was just simply hearing that suffering has its causes, therefore it can be, those causes can be removed and there's a way to happiness, there's a natural path to happiness. <coughs> so happiness isn't just something that we're either fortunate enough to have or not, happiness is something that we can cultivate and train in, train toward. As well as that, I wanted to talk about it because I think, you know, seeing the teachings in that context shows that happiness is the kind of direction we should be inclining in. So if your practice is leading to increasing peace, then you know you're on the right path. There were quite a few suttas like this in uh, the Buddhist teachings. Um, one was of his aunt, Mahapajapati Gotami, who was a nun, the first nun in the Buddha's day. Um, and she came to him and said, please, can you give me the teachings in brief? You know, she didn't have very long. She wanted to go to the forest and meditate. And he said, whatever leads to peace is basically the path. Whatever leads to peace and a few other things like disenchantment, disengagement, a kind of drawing away, drawing inward, a drawing toward more solitude, that is the path. And if you're going in that direction, you know that this must be the Dhamma. So the Dhamma has that taste of peace, and this is a different kind of happiness than the coarse happinesses that we're used to in the world. Right? So I wanted this to be an encouragement to develop the right kind of happiness, the wholesome happiness, and to explain a bit how that can happen in the process of meditation, but also to have a little bit of a look at the definitions that are common. There's one in uh, the Oxford English Dictionary which says um, that happiness is a state of a state of feeling or showing pleasure or contentment. Okay? So that's talking about a state. And it's quite limited in a way. I mean, I like that it uses the word contentment because contentment for me is something much deeper than pleasure. Pleasure seems to be a very transitory thing that is perhaps quite based on sensations like physical feelings or, you know, the sense stimulation. Whereas contentment to me seems to transcend that and perhaps there's a possibility to be content even with feelings that aren't very pleasurable or very happy. Right? And then the other one, which came from an approach called positive psychology, is similar to that, but they try to tie it up with um, your life situation. So they say that happiness is a state which is characterized by uh, contentment and general satisfaction with your current situation. Okay, so they've tried to go a little bit deeper with this, but I actually feel it falls flatter for me. Because if we have to be content with our current situation, and that was happiness, then it's not going to last long, you know, because our current situation is current only maybe for a day or two. Maybe you get on a roll and it lasts for a few years, but situations change all the time. So if we're depending on things like our job, you know, or our salary, apparently salary is only a determinant of happiness up to about 
£50,000, and after that, it doesn't really make much difference. Any extra money over and above that makes no difference to happiness. This has been researched in psychology, so I find that quite fascinating. You know? So the whole pursuit of money is, is rather meaningless, because once you have your basic needs met, and perhaps you can go on a nice holiday you know, once a year or twice a year, or quite a lot for 50000 you can do quite a lot, then there's not a lot more you can get out of it. You know, money is very limited. In terms of jobs, I think there's a difference you know, between a job that you do just for the sake of having to work and something which is more like an occupation, which is uh, perhaps something you feel your talents are suited to or you feel a particular ethical, um, um, what's the word, resonance with. You know, there's some very beautiful professions. In the car, Kirsty was telling me about her work with uh, people with learning disabilities, particularly autism. And um, I could sense that you got a lot of satisfaction from that work. And my mother also did something very similar in her work. And it was satisfying until the bureaucracy hit in. But, <laughs> but then at a deeper level than that, there's also something which is known more as a calling in life. And I think for me, this has been the greatest determinant of happiness. Because until I found my path, I had experienced a lot of happiness in life. I'd also experienced depression. And uh, in my teens, I really struggled with that and found a way through it by having some cognitive therapy and learning to just perceive things a bit differently, basically change my negative thought patterns into something a lot more positive. Because you realize that you can use your mind in ways that bring you happiness or lead to further suffering. So, you know, that was very effective and it, I came out of it pretty quickly. Um, but I still had this wish to find something deeper. So I left England when I was about nine, eight, 18, actually. Um, but the big one was kind of leaving at 19 and going to India, of all places, just to terrify my mother. <laughs> you know, and I didn't know what to expect in a, in a continent like India at all. Um, but it was really eye-opening, and one of the first things I saw there was that although people had very little at the material level, there seemed to be a sense of being connected to something greater than themselves, maybe through their religious beliefs or perhaps through just living in a massive sea of humanity like that and seeing life and death just taking place on the streets there every day in front of you, you know. Death wasn't hidden. I mean, there are actually places you can go, like Varanasi in India, where death is happening right there and the bodies are coming down to the river Ganges to be burned. And, you know, you see the bodies being carried through the streets on palaquins and, and it's just an everyday event for people, you know. I mean, of course, there are a lot of holy men, holy women, you know, and there is this sense of a, a spiritual search, a different dimension of life. You know, even the concept that you could be a lay person or you could be a recluse or a, an aesthetic um, is very present in India. So for me, it felt very clear from the beginning of my path that this was an option, you know, and that this was a way of life I could actually follow should I ever get the chance to do so. But uh, in India, I also had my hedonistic pleasures, you know. I travelled a lot, I uh, went to the full moon parties in the Himalayas. You wouldn't know where you were until the morning, and you'd wake up and you'd be like faced with these huge white cap mountains, you know and amazing decorations that people have put in the rhododendron bushes and, you know, all these wonderful people that you were with from all over the world. And it was really quite uh, exciting, you know, especially at that age. And then, of course, just the, the pleasure of being in a different culture, um, learning yoga, for example, becoming healthier, all of these things. Um, and so I experienced a lot, and yet there was still this sense that there's nothing, that's not quite deep enough for me. There's something I'm still missing here. And it's interesting, in psychology they call this, um, I don't know if I can say the word, eudaimonic happiness. So you have the hedonic one, which is basically um, pleasure, an experience of pleasure which is higher than the proportion of pain that you feel. Right? So when that tips, then it's no more really pleasurable. So your experience is mainly one of effective happiness, right? And this can include satisfaction in one's job or life or relationship. But the eudaimon eudaimonic one um, conceptualizes happiness as the result of a pursuit and attainment of meaning in life and a path or a purpose, yeah? And I think this goes in hand in hand with the idea of service. And for me, very early on in my path, after discovering meditation, I also started to give service in the meditation retreats, and that deepened the happiness and sense of purpose considerably, because I felt like I was connected to contributing to something more meaningful than my own life, 
something that could help others, and something which was universal. And this was something really emphasised in that particular approach, which I'll always value to today, that the Dhamma is universal. You know, it has results. So if we put these causes in place, it gives the results. If the results aren't coming, you're not practising, right? So Dhamma is always something beautiful and something that leads towards peace, it leads towards well-being, and it leads towards the wholesome states increasing. Yeah. I mean, of course, in life there can still be ups and downs, but I think when you have this happiness that comes from within, you have a greater resource to meet those vicissitudes of life without getting completely thrown away to one side or the other. You know, you don't get elated when things go especially well because you know it's going to change. And you don't get completely crushed and deflated when things go wrong, you know, because it's all framed in a bigger context. And for me, the first context that really changed my life was hearing the Buddha talk about reality in terms of the Four Noble Truths. Yeah, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but these are the truths which are based around suffering, okay? But that obviously carries with it the opposite dimension of happiness. So the Buddha said that the first noble truth is the truth that there is suffering, yeah? And he said that suffering is not to be avoided or not to be run away from, but is to be understood. And for me, this was already wonderful because I had suffered in my life, not for reasons that I necessarily understood myself, you know? I just knew that if my mind wasn't happy, nothing outside could compensate for that. And here the Buddha was saying, you know, suffering is a part of the path, and if you can understand it, it leads to freedom. So it wasn't pointless suffering, you know. It was actually suffering that led to freedom, suffering that led to happiness, yeah. Ajahn Chah, who is my teacher's teacher, says there are two kinds of suffering. One is the suffering that leads to more suffering, and one is the suffering that leads to the end of suffering. So I felt like I struck lucky here. <laughs> Yeah, so that's the first noble truth. And then the second one is that there's a cause, right? And the cause is wanting. In a nutshell, the cause is wanting or craving. So anything that takes you out of the present moment into wanting to be somewhere else or wanting to be someone else than you are, you know, or to be with a different feeling than the one you have right now, a different mental state than the one you have right now, yeah? I've got a bit of burning in my tummy from the journey and also from my medicines that I'm taking at the moment. But, you know, if I don't want that, then I make a big deal of it and it becomes like the predominant experience that I'm having right now. But actually, I'd forgotten all about it until I just mentioned the word suffering. <laughs> because I'm focused on something different. I'm focused on giving and I'm focused on, you know, the Dhamma and what the Dhamma means and trying to share that with you, you know. And, and just the beauty of the fact that we're gathered here to practice Dhamma together and to discuss this. It's really quite amazing. It's quite wonderful. Yeah? So there's a cause for suffering. So of course, as soon as there's a cause, you know there can be a, a way to eradicate that cause. And the eradication of the cause is the opposite of the wanting. So it is the contentment, it's the letting go, it's the giving, the giving away. Right? So the whole thrust of this practice is away from self-oriented interest yeah, and into interest of others, interest of, you know, orienting to ourselves, to ourselves to the happiness of others and to wanting to be of service to others. Yeah, so the whole practice starts with compassion. So the Buddha said, you know, that all beings desire happiness and recoil from pain. And because of that, you know, morality, ethics makes sense. Yeah? We don't want to cause harm to ourselves or others. And the two are inextricably linked. You know, if I'm causing harm to someone else, it's usually because I'm struggling inside myself. And when I cause harm to somebody else, even if I didn't realise I was struggling, I certainly will be after that. I'll have a court case or I'll have, you know, some kind of retribution. Someone punches me on the nose or whatever, or just, you know, I lose the trust of friends if I've been gossiping or backbiting. You know, there's many, many downsides to uh, not living an ethical life. And yet ethics is more than that. Ethics is also the positive side, right? So not only do we not kill, but we develop compassion to all living beings. That's the opposite, and that's the active side of the virtue. Yeah? And so instead of stealing, we actually learn generosity. What do I really need? You know? Do I really need all the stuff I've got stuffed in my cupboards at home, or could I actually give some of them away? You know? Or even just starting to be less kind of covetous and looking at other people and what they've got, and, and, and learning to simplify, yeah? Learning to simplify is the opposite of trying to acquire. 
And so this is very freeing. All of this is a movement towards freeing and unburdening ourselves, yeah. And so the opposite of harsh speech or false speech is gentle speech and truthful speech. Yeah? Speech that brings harmony, speech that defi- divides, sorry, reunites the divided. Yeah? So it brings about harmony. And another one is uh, rather than gossiping, we speak words that are worth recording. We speak words that bring uplift and bring meaning and bring inspiration to people. Right? So there's all these ways we can use our speech in order to bring about happiness in the world. And another thing that uh, I read on a tea bag actually just the other day when I was talking about something that wasn't particularly making me happy, <laughs> my uh, <laughs> current housemate said to me, Oh, there's this thing on the tea bag. It says, uh, Speak to yourself in ways that bring happiness. And I thought, Oh, oh yeah, that's really wise actually, because I'm speaking now in a way that's not really bringing me happiness. And how many times do we not only do that with others, but we speak to ourselves in ways that are really quite cruel? Cool. You know, oh, for goodness sake, you always do that. You shouldn't have done that, don't you know by now? You know, there's this kind of horrible inner tyrannical voice that goes round and round our heads telling us we should be different or better or we should have known better, right? Often that's conditioned. I mean, it is conditioned, actually, from the society, from our parents, from our culture. But once we start to recognize this and we see what we're doing, you know, and whether this is leading to happiness or not, we can start to walk the path. We can start to use our mind in a way that moves away from that suffering out of compassion for ourselves and compassion for others and moves towards looking at the world, perceiving the world, thinking about the world in ways that leads to happiness. Yeah. So this is the start of the training. But anyway, there's not a lot of time to go through the entire path, but uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, yeah, so I talked about the cause of suffering and the way out of suffering, which is the giving, the letting go, yeah? the being generous, living a life of virtue, etc., etc. And of course that leads into meditation eventually, which we've all just had a little taste of. Um, and then the last one is uh, the path, right? So we'll get into that a bit more in a minute. But first of all, I just wanted to mention about the Buddha's own description of happiness and what happiness is. Because we've had the Western definition, which is, I think, a little bit limited. Um, And we also talked about it being hedonic, so, you know, in search of pleasure. So do we think that the Buddha searched for pleasure or not? What do you think? No? (laughs) Okay, so you're sort of half right and half wrong, because in the beginning, before the Buddha was enlightened, he actually thought that he had to shun all pleasure, and he leaned towards a life of austerity, But when he realized the Dhamma and realized the truth of suffering and the end of suffering, he found that that is one of the extremes, you know, self-torture, tiring one's body, tiring oneself out is actually the wrong way because it doesn't lead to happiness, it doesn't lead to freedom. But equally the wrong way, he said, was the pursuit of sense pleasure. Okay, so he said that sense pleasure is actually, uh, the words he used were quite uh, confronting in a way. He said that sensual pleasure is low, is vulgar, is inferior. Is, uh, he even called it filthy pleasure, which is quite interesting, because it's not so much a value judgment as a description of that pleasure in rela- compared to the higher pleasures of the mind. So when you're experiencing something much purer, then the pleasures of the senses appear just dirty and ordinary, very worldly. Yeah? It's not really looking down on it, but it's trying to tell you there's something more. Right? So he didn't encourage us to follow those sense pleasures. And he said that they're not to be pursued. Right? So he's not saying that we can't experience sense pleasure, because that's obviously a part of life. And sometimes it's important to eat, like for example, a good meal, which I had today. I had a delicious meal. And it helps digestion, you know. Or you want to go to see a movie with a friend. It's perfectly okay. You're not monks and nuns. You know, I don't go and do that, but that's a choice. You know, I could if I wanted to, but I choose not to because I prefer to sit quietly and meditate or maybe watch a Dhamma talk instead. So it's not that he's judging this, but he is saying that it's not leading to enlightenment. And in that way, it's not beneficial. So the Buddha's concerned with our benefit. He's concerned with compassion. He's teaching out of compassion. So he's pointing us in a direction that leads to deeper happiness. So the sense pleasures are the one of the ways that he defined happiness, and they're the kind which are not to be pursued. But there was another kind of happiness that the Buddha talked about, and this is in the Majjhima Nikaya. It's 139 for anyone who reads the suttas. It's in the Theravada Pali texts. 
Um, and he said that you should know how to define happiness and knowing that, pursue the pleasure within oneself. And so this related to different kind of pleasure that is the pleasure born of meditation. And he was particularly talking in this case about the higher states of samadhi. So I'm not sure what people's experience here is with meditation, but samadhi in brief is a state of deep peace, inner peace, that's co-joined with a lot of happiness, but very tranquil happiness, and it's when the mind and the object are completely uh, unified, right? So the mind is completely stilled. So in the way that we were just focusing on the breath, it was gently, okay? It wasn't like with harsh force. But when this becomes deeper and the breath starts to open up and you start to feel happiness with the breath, the mind just starts to get pulled into that object and the two things start to become almost one and the same. And then a lot of joy can arise from that because you've put down such a lot. You know, you've put down all the complexity of the thinking mind, you know, the different sensations, the diversity of sensations in the body, and the mind's just become very kind of uh, content and settled with one very simple object, yeah? And from there, the mind starts to build up energy and bliss. So as the mindfulness increases, the happiness increases. With the happiness comes the energy. With the energy, you get more happiness, right? So it's kind of like a snowball effect once you get into this. There's a lot of happiness, and it's a happiness born of stillness and contentment rather than sense pleasures. So the Buddha said of these kind of uh, happinesses that they're very different because they lead you in a different direction. So it's not that the middle path has two extremes and that we're supposed to go somewhere in between those two extremes, not really hate stuff, but not really like stuff too much either, but just kind of a very passive, kind of bland existence. That's not what the Buddha's talking about. He's actually talking about the two extremes are those within the sense world. The middle path is going away from the sense world in a completely different direction, right? So it's actually going away from those two extremes into a different, inward, basically, a different <coughs> direction. So within ourselves. And he said that those pleasures are to be pursued, are to be cultivated, and are not to be feared. Right? And he had words for these. So he said that the states of samadhi, which are otherwise known as jhanas, um, are pleasures which are born, on, born of seclusion, born of renunciation. And again, renunciation is a bit, probably not a very popular word, but it means uh, putting down stuff that you don't need. Right? So you renounce the suffering, the things that cause you suffering. Like here tonight, you renounced going home. Maybe the family is a nice family, but still, you wanted a break from the family tonight. Or you wanted, you know, you've obviously left work, so you're not working late at night or anything like that. You've put it down. You've even put dinner down, which is most uh, admirable, because I don't eat dinner, so I didn't have to put it down. <laughs> so this is what renunciation means, but obviously it can go deeper than that, and you can start to renounce even the body and just go even deeper into the mind and then renounce even the coarser feelings of pleasure for something stiller. So renunciation is also a spectrum. So the, the pleasures of renunciation, of seclusion, the pleasure of peace, upasamasukha, which is a beautiful word. So this is a different kind of happiness than the types discussed in modern psychology. It's a peace. It doesn't even relate to satisfaction with your job or anything like that. You've put it all aside and you're just going inward. And then the last one, he said, is that these are the happinesses of enlightenment, which is quite surprising because, of course, most of us who know anything about Buddhism will know that uh, samadhi states are not actually states of enlightenment yet. But because they're so uh, powerful and so um, free from a sense of self and free from so many burdens of the body and, you know, the coarser states of mind, all thinking has gone Usually the hearing is gone, you know, the senses are really starting to quieten down. So he compared that to the bliss of enlightenment because the pleasure is so strong and it's so, so different from anything you can get in the world. So I don't want to kind of freak you all out by thinking, oh, that's way too far down the line for me. So what I did want to do was quickly go through um, some of the steps in the beginning because this is a gradual path and there's a training to lead up to this. And it starts, as we said before, with the virtue, right? And even at the level of virtue, the Buddha said, there's a lot of happiness to be had there. And he encouraged us to reflect on our good deeds. He called it chaganisati. It means bringing up your own goodness, your own virtue. 
And there are different ways you can do this. You know, you can just sit down and remember some of the things you've done today that you felt brought happiness to yourself or to other people, you know, or maybe something that happened to you that caused gratitude to arise or something you did for someone else and they felt very moved by that. Bring it up in your mind just to remind yourself how that feels. So this isn't egotistical. This is actually just training the mind to look in a different direction for its happiness. Because so much of the time we don't notice absences, right? We think, oh, well, I didn't do anything bad, but so what? I mean, why would I? But the fact that you didn't react to that mean comment that somebody said to you at work is actually a big thing. You know, you've saved yourself and other people a lot of suffering. And in that moment of non-reaction, there was a certain stopping, there was a certain wisdom there that caused peace. You know, you knew this is the right track, I'm on the right track here. I'm not adding to the problem, yeah? So there's all these things we can do, and I just wanted to read out a few words about um, uh, one of the reflections you can do with the sealer, um, or one of the results, perhaps, of living a life of ethics. So this is from the Majjhima Nikaya 129, another one of the texts, and it says, I'm going to change man for woman, because after all, there's not enough women around on the Buddhist scene, although there are always a lot of meditators who are female, not represented as leaders. <laughs> So here it says, when a wise woman is on her chair or on her bed or resting on the, on the ground, then the good actions that she did in the past, her bodily, verbal and mental actions, cover her, overspread her and envelop, envelop her. Just as the shadow of a great mountain peak in the evening covers, overspreads and envelops the earth, so too when a wise woman is on her chair or on her bed or resting on the ground, then the good actions that she did in the past, her bodily, verbal, and mental conduct, cover her, overspread her, and envelop her. Then she thinks, I've not done what is bad, I've not done what is cruel, I've not done what is wrong, I've done what is good, I've done what is wholesome, and I've made myself a shelter from anguish. Isn't that nice? And that's so nice, you know, that we're being encouraged to reflect in that way. And the Buddha called that the bliss of blamelessness, right? And then in this sequence that I wanted to go through, and I'm probably going to run out of time, <laughs> in this sequence, it's part of a natural process that gets the happiness flowing, right? So the Buddha says that for one who is virtuous, you do not need to make the wish or exert the volition, may I be free from remorse, because it's natural if you have a virtuous life that you won't have remorse. You won't, you know, basically non-remorse will be uh, just there for you, right? And again, there's a bliss to that. It's not just a lack of remorse, it's actually a happiness that you can look at, reflect on, and bring up in your mind, yeah? At the moment, I'm doing a lot of service because I'm trying to establish a monastery, and I was sent over here by my teacher on quite a difficult mission because I didn't have a trust in place when we started. Also, I can't handle money, okay? So this is like just putting another little factor into the mix. I can't handle money and I can't cook as a Theravada nun. So I had to basically figure out how to survive on the ground without any permanent base and gather some trustees around me, <laughs> start doing some teaching and basically present this idea and try to, you know, encourage people to be involved and keep them inspired with the vision of where it's leading and why we need such things and, you know, what the practice is all about. So this is quite a lot of work and it was definitely a challenge, but, you know, sometimes happiness isn't only about an easy life. Sometimes it can be very difficult and create, you know, cause a lot of uh, tiredness and struggle, but because of the sense of meaning that's imbued there, it still nourishes the mind and the heart. And so I can still bring up quite a lot of joy from what I'm doing. And especially when people come and stay and they say that they get benefit from coming or, you know, that it means a lot to them that this is happening. It really gives me a lot of happiness because it's not easy for people to find things to be happy about in the world these days. Most of the news is not about places of refuge and safety and practice and harmony. You know, it's not. It's about Donald Trump and Brexit and all the rest. <laughs> what on earth is going to happen to the economy and what's happening to the climate? You know, and I mean, obviously, these are real issues and we need to be strong enough to kind of know how to deal with that. But by always immersing ourselves in the bad news, we're just draining ourselves of energy and we're not resourcing our minds. 
So, you know, these are ways to resource ourselves and to actually bring some resilience and perhaps some clarity as well from where we can act if need be. Yeah? So it's not about being completely passive and ignorant of what's happening and trying to avoid it, but it is about trying to resource and nourish our minds so that from a place of well-being we know how to respond wisely rather than with reaction, reactivity. Yeah, yeah. I better not say that, but, well, I'm going to say it. <laughs> because I'm conditioned. But in my family, my parents do watch a lot of news and, you know, get very upset with the things that are happening. And I do try to say, you know, I'm not sure that it's so healthy just to keep reading about it, you know. Because, of course, whatever you put in your mind is, is going to keep coming back at you. Even when you turn the TV off or put the newspaper down, you have that uh, residue there. You know, it, it creates a sense that the world is a difficult and unfair place, unjust place that you don't really want to live in, right? So we have to create our own mini-world as well, because the reality for us now is that we're not in that context. We're in a room of people who are trying to be good people, who want to learn about kindness and how to you know, act in kind ways and bring happiness to the world and happiness to ourselves and take responsibility you know, this is a big one with practice, right? We're learning to take responsibility for our own actions and thoughts. So this is also happening. That's just as true as the other. So it's good to reflect on that and just, uh, you know, the goodness of our intention that we bring to the practice. Yeah? And then alongside the sila comes a great confidence in the path. Yeah? A confidence that something can be done. There is a path to practice. And as I was saying before, this confidence can lead to joy arising. So by the time we sit down to meditate, you know, we have the base of sila, we have the base of confidence, we've heard the teachings, we've got some kind of faith in those, and, sh and joy should be there for us. You know? There are various ways we can uh, use to help establish that joy, but it's not supposed to be just plain old suffering from the minute you sit down to meditate. You, know? you can sit down and you can start to reflect in a wise way. Yeah, you can bring up images of the Buddha or people who are kind or bring up things you've done that you feel grateful for, things that have happened which were wonderful, things that you've done which were wonderful, and get the joy flowing. Yeah? And another way to get that joy flowing in the meditation is uh, the practice of loving-kindness, metta. Yeah? This is what we chanted at the beginning. Yeah? This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness. And then it has all these beautiful qualities that enable you to open the heart and practice metta and bring love to all beings. Yeah? So it's quite a high um, practice, and people think that's just a beginner's thing, but it's, it's actually a very deep thing you know, to purify the mind so much that we can have this loving kindness even to people who hurt us or even people we don't agree with and have very different views from us. Yeah, so the loving kindness is a beautiful reflection and it can bring a lot of uplift to the heart. So then from the joy, which is already starting to refine this you know, very wholesome pleasure, it can turn into rapture, what is called rapture in the practice. Uh, the Pali for that is piti. And this arises when there becomes a strong interest in our meditation object. So for example, we're working with the breath and the breath starts to feel very soft very smooth, maybe quite pleasant, yeah? You can either get into just one breath or you might get into the rhythm of the breath and just the mind starts to settle on that and get some kind of energy coming up. And because your mind's not kind of uh, diverted to lots and lots of different things, the mindfulness starts to build and because of that the energy arises, right? So the Buddha likens um, mindfulness building to kind of plugging up a leaky bucket. So when the bucket has leaks, the mindfulness goes out and the energy kind of drains. But if you can plug it up by staying on the one thing, then it just starts to build and all that lovely energy starts to kind of fill up this bucket. Yeah, so you keep that on the breath. And my teacher, Ajahn Graham, says that um, this is the kind of pivot point in meditation because you start to enjoy the practice. And because you're enjoying it, you don't need to make a volition like, may I stay with the breath no matter what, you know, I'm going to stay with it, I'm not letting it go. This doesn't have to be done at all. You want to stay with it because it's simple and it's easy and it's natural. If you're still struggling to get onto the breath, it's probably because you're not ready yet, yeah? So that's why, I mean, it's a very short session, but in the meditation, I just tried to get you to start with the body sensations. And then if your mind's ready for the breath, let it come. If it's not, just let it go. Because it, it doesn't help to try and grab something. Yeah? It's like a little birdie that comes along. It's like a very delicate, shy bird. 
And if you grab it really tightly, you just kill the bird. But if you hold it really loosely, it flies off and it's gone. Right? So you have to learn this way to hold it in a very tender and gentle way. Just enough kind of focus, just enough softness. And it's, it's really a very subtle thing. Yeah? Also, you need different amounts of this sort of holding at different times. Sometimes the mind's just naturally happy with the breath. Other times it's a little bit more... Uh, agitated and it needs just a bit more encouragement. But the whole point of this sequence that's happening in this uh, particular sutta, this particular teaching, is that it is happening naturally. It's not through an act of will. One thing leads to the next. Right? Each thing conditions the next. So the joy conditions the bliss and then from there you start to calm the mind. So from the, the piti that arises in the mind once the mind's had its fill of that and the body's had its fill of that, the whole thing starts to settle down and you experience something much more tranquil. And the Buddha says this is like somebody who's been searching in a desert for water or for shade and they come across a big tree and they're able to sit under that tree in the shade and just, ah, just relax and cool down. So the tranquility is the stage where the mind and the body is so still and so quiet that you can just easily sit for long periods of time without trying to do so. you know, Because we're not in any sort of competition with anyone else or with ourselves here. Like, I can sit on the chair longer than you can sit. I can sit on the floor, forget the chair. you know, Or like, oh, I used to be in a monastery, actually, where someone was sitting for 12 hours every night. Non-stop, okay. <laughs> and it became a bit of an ego thing. You know, like, I can sit for the whole 12 hours. I don't need to go to the toilet. It's like, well, okay, but... But also, she did confide at one point that uh, she felt pressure to keep that up because she was starting to get a reputation for that, you know, and people were coming to see her, like, where's the nun that sits for 12 hours? <laughs> and there's just, you're just basically going the same way as of the world, right? You've gone from spiritual values and, you know, you've taken worldly values and just described them to spiritual values. So it's kind of a spiritualized materialism. In a way, so we're not trying to get anything or be anyone other than you know right where we are, right who we are. So this tranquility is very peaceful and very lovely, and you know you don't feel the need to move, your mind doesn't feel the need to move, and from the tranquility, this leads into even deeper happiness, which is called sukha, and this is the uh, precondition for the deep samadhi, right? So the deep states of stillness. So this, so this just again shows that samadhi or stillness is not achieved by an act of will, its condition, proximate condition, is happiness. So it's only the happy mind that can go into the deep states of samadhi. Yeah? And at this stage of uh, happiness with the sukha that comes from the mind, um, it can be really quite overwhelming because you may not have experienced anything like this before. And it's a classic uh, experience for many people that go to these sorts of stages in meditation that they'll either experience fear or excitement because it's something that's happening because you're letting go and in a way you're starting to disappear like the sense of self is starting to disappear and the process is really starting to take off on its own without you being involved and at this point if you do interfere with the process and go oh I better just shift my attention a bit you know or hey what's going on here something's happening <laughs> then the whole thing starts to unravel and, and the happiness starts to subside so it's really something that happens when you stand out of the way but by standing out of the way, it can be scary because you're going to places that you're not familiar with, right? And so this fear can start to come up, like, I don't know what's going to happen next. The other thing that can happen, if you're more like me, probably, is a little bit of excitement. So this is when you start to kind of, again, get out of the present moment and start to lurch into the future, like, what's going to happen next, you know? And you've kind of lost that contentment, that centeredness in the present moment. So it's... Yeah, the fears like you sort of recede and retract and the excitement's like you lurch forward. So these are very, very subtle things that the mind's habituated to do. And these stages are quite interesting because they reveal those tendencies, right, which are conditioned very deeply. <coughs> and, uh, yeah, one more thing I think is worth mentioning at this point is that uh, another experience that can happen to a lot of people, probably mostly Westerners, is guilt can come up at this point because we're not accustomed to happiness, right? And we almost feel like we don't deserve it. So that's one of the reasons I wanted to talk about it tonight because the Buddha's saying that you do deserve it, right? And that this is a natural part of the practice. 
So it's not helpful for us to suffer along with everyone else. You know, sometimes we feel that if other people are suffering, we don't have the right to be happy. But how is our suffering going to contribute to the overall happiness in the world? It's not, you know. I mean, it's quite natural, of course, to feel guilt or to feel that you don't deserve things. And this is something, you know, you can work with. But uh, it's also helpful, I think, to understand that this is kind of not, nothing to do with you at this point and that the guilt that comes up is, it's an old habit, it's conditioned, but uh, it is an obstacle and it doesn't really belong in Buddhism. I don't think there's any concept of guilt in the whole Buddha's teachings. He does talk about remorse, you know, when you do things that you later regret or feel that you shouldn't have done, but there's no point beating yourself up about that and, in fact, it just prolongs the problem. The best thing to do is say, okay, I did this, it had that outcome, maybe I'll, I'll try not to do that again. It's like, just learn from the mistakes and move on. Because, you know, staying with the old problems, with the old mistakes, is just going to drain your energy and make you feel quite undermined and disempowered. Right? So guilt doesn't really have a place in the Buddha's teachings. So then what happens, <laughs> I'm aware of the time, but we will have time for Q&A, then what happens after the, uh, the happiness is that we get into the deeper states of stillness. And so this is when the mind becomes unified with its object. And the reason that this is important is because it's the first time that we've truly overcome what we call the five hindrances. And these are the hindrances of craving, of aversion, of uh, doubt, of restlessness, and of uh, sleepiness, sloth and torpor. So until this point, these things are always operating to some extent in our mind when we're trying to meditate. And because of that, we can't really see what's going on very clearly. So the purpose of attaining these states is not just to resource your mind with very deep happiness and to show you that there's a different kind of path, you know, and a different kind of happiness that's much more fulfilling and much more long-lasting. It's also to show you that, to enable you to see things clearly, right? Because it's the first time that these hindrances, which the Buddha called obscurations of the mind, which weaken wisdom, it's the first time that they're not there. So the hindrances are always distorting the truth. So imagine when you're angry, for example, with somebody. At that moment, you only see the negative things in that person. You just forget every other quality that they have. If it's a marriage, you forget even the reason why you got married in the first place. But there were seriously some quite strong reasons, right? <laughs> Otherwise, there's no way you'd have done that. So, but when the mind's full of anger or hurt or disappointment, you know, we just can't see the truth at that moment, and we have a very biased perspective. And it's the same with craving. When you want something, you tend to project all your wants onto that person or onto that situation in a very unrealistic way, you know. I mean, it happens with teachers, too, and I'm quite fortunate, really, because I think I have quite a down-to-earth relationship with my teacher. And whilst I admire him incredibly deeply, I mean, you know, I really see the depth of his kindness and wisdom. I mean, it's actually beyond what I can see, but <laughs> I've never felt so safe and so fully loved unconditionally by any being in the world. And at the same time, I can relate to him as a human being because he's human and he has his conditioning, you know. And I think that's very healthy, not to relate to our teachers as sort of special or superior beings in any way, because we're all human, right? And it gets really tricky when we expect them to be something that they simply can't be, because that hasn't been their conditioning. Yeah. So at this point in the practice, when we have these hindrances overcome, the Buddha says the mind becomes soft. It's like melted gold, liquid gold, and you can actually bend it and use it for anything you want to. So that means that you can use it in any way you wish to see the truth. So if you want to look at the Four Noble Truths, you can look at the Four Noble Truths. If you want to discover the truth of impermanence, you can direct the mind towards impermanence. And the mind, he says, is pliable and it's unbiased. Right? And also it's very resourced. So you're not going to kind of get freaked out by these things. The ordinary mind might get a little bit concerned if it sees that everything's going to fade away and my body's subject to death and I'm subject to death and, you know, all my loved ones are going to leave me. That can be quite confronting. But when the mind is very resourced and very enriched by this happiness, it's able to see these things clearly and it can sustain its attention on these things for long enough to really see right into them and through that be free, right? So through that it can be free. <coughs> So when we see these truths of 
suffering and impermanence and also that there is no permanent essence within ourself, that everything is essentially non-self, it's not me and it doesn't belong to me. When we see that, then clinging is released because there's no point clinging to something that is essentially suffering or that is essentially going to pass away. Even if it's happy some of the time, that can't last, right? Yeah? And you've experienced something much happier anyway. So all the other things that used to take us pleasure don't seem that attractive anymore. Just like when a child like progresses from, I don't know, infant school to junior school, they're not interested in their old toys. They want to use crayons and make paintings and you know, get into other stuff, start writing stories or whatever. And then later on, that's not so interesting either. So it's not that we judge what we used to be interested in, but over time, you know, our minds become more refined and we want a deeper, more fulfilling happiness. So when we don't cling, of course, we don't create more suffering. And this is how the whole process becomes unraveled. Yeah? And so the Buddha says that from samadhi, we have a chance to see things as they truly are. When we see things as they truly are, then we lose our interest in the conditioned world. So we start to fade things start to fade from our awareness. We don't make much of these <coughs> things anymore. And from that, the mind can be released and can be freed. So that there's no clinging to any conditioned state, right? And so at this point, the happiness goes kind of literally through the ceiling and through the world and out of this world. <laughs> because not only do we know how to you know, be happy in the world, and our minds are very resourced, we're full of loving kindness and compassion and sympathetic joy and also equanimity, we also know the happiness of when things end completely, and that's called the happiness of Nibbana. Right? So the Buddha talks about this in a, a sutta called the Bahu Vedaniya Sutta, and he says that there are um, all these different kinds of happiness, but they're not all necessarily dependent on feeling. Right? We usually define happiness as feeling or pleasure, but here he's saying that there are the pleasures of these four jhanas, these four states of samadhi, deep meditation, <coughs> And there are also states of deep meditation where there's no materiality at all, so it's just mental states, purely mental states. But then he said the highest happiness is when even those end and there's no feeling at all. So this is very difficult to understand. But, he, um, but his chief disciple, Sariputta, explains it, and he, you know, somebody asks him, well, how can you say that's happiness if there's nothing to be felt? And he says it's precisely because there's nothing to be felt that this is happiness. Right. So that's a kind of quite a deep thing to say and quite a maybe cliffhanger thing to say, but I think the whole path is unknown at this stage to us, you know. But the scope is very deep, the scope is very wide, and it's a gradual path. So it all begins, you know, just from learning to be kind, learning to live a simple life, a life of gratitude, a life of generosity. And it can go all the way into the highest happinesses. <coughs> but don't worry, because if you practice it properly... With, without willpower, but with this kind of beautiful sense of joy and deepening naturally into the path, you'll be resourced enough to see these things. And with each sort of uncovering of the truth, there'll be that release of clinging and there'll be the consequent peace and happiness. Yeah. So this is a little talk, which became quite a long talk. And now I would like to... Uh, give you some time for questions and answers and complaints.